Hello everyone. Welcome to a video about understanding Earth. I thought it would be quite fun to go to through this book. Look at some interesting chapters that might be inspirational and maybe you can learn something from it. I will just scroll through, look at some cool pictures and talk a bit about it as well. I hope you enjoyed. So let's start on the first page. We can see some things quite interesting already. Can start here with the time scale, geological, where we start here in the Hadean, Archean, Proterozoic, and the Phanerozoic, where we as humans existed only here at 0.3 MA, 0.2, sorry, Homo sapiens. The evolutionary Big Bang started 542 million years ago. So animals and life of any kind has only started here. If you look at the full time scale, that's not that long at all. We will focus mainly on the climate system today. In this bit of an old book, we will focus in mostly on the climate system today. Talk a bit about rivers, look at some nice pictures as well. It's a book about from John Rutzinger and Thomas H. Jordan. If you would want to read it yourself, this is the seventh edition. So let's read this chapter right now. Earth is a unique place, home to millions of organisms, including ourselves. No other planet we have yet discovered has the same delicate balance of conditions necessary to sustain life. Geology is the science that studies Earth, how it was born, how it evolved, and how it works and how we can help presence, help preserve its habits for life. Geologists seek answers to many basic questions. What material is the planet composed? Why are there continents and oceans? Have the Himalaya, Alps and Rocky Mountains rise to their great heights? Why are some regions subject to earthquakes and volcanic eruptions while others are not? the surface and life and things evolve over billions of years. What changes are likely in the future? We think we will find the answers to such questions fascinating. Welcome to the science of geology. So the first part of the book, the first couple chapters really focus on all types of geo geology, what type of rock, sedimentary, igneous, made from the depths of our planet. The later chapters will focus more on the surface of the Earth. We will go past those as well. I will focus mostly on the Earth's surface for now. Maybe in another video we can look at the more geological concepts from this book. Let me An astronaut checks out instrumentation for monitoring Earth's surface. Can see that. Let's 
really amazing geological record preserves evidence of Earth's long history. Look at this beautiful layers carved out by wind, water maybe from past times. Absolutely beautiful. It gets very sciencey. Obviously, not only beautiful pictures, it's also something you should be able to learn from it. I will try to mostly go to like nice pictures and talk some about it. We had some Let's see here. Wow. That's a big I found this a very interesting picture. It's groundwater flows from a cliff in Vasey's Paradise Marble Canyon, Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. It says where hilly topographic allows it to flow out into the surface in natural springs. So because you have these different layers, one layer contains water and when it comes on a less porous layer, it will flow out. And this can happen from like clay, but it can also happen in other materials such as less porous or more porous sandstones. Which I found very interesting. It's something new when you see this don't really think about the different geologies that may evolve here. You just see a beautiful waterfall, which it is, of course. But it's so interesting to me that concepts like this, uncemented sandstone, cemented sandstone, have such an incredible effect on the things we see with our naked eye. I've never visited. America. But when you see things like this, you really want to go. We also have different ways of fetching groundwaters for us as humans. With these wells, for example, depending on where the what a table is. <coughs> Excuse me. Some water flows can flow into these artesian wells, which are absolutely stunning. When you have a pressure, I'll show this picture. When you have pressure from a water table, from a hill, down here like this and one would make a hole right here because of the pressure from the uplands you get water shooting up right there and smile all over you get something like that and that absolutely amazing how that can happen from a concept like that. It's truly magnificent. Something like this is called a confined aquifer. Something in the US has a lot of uh, a lot of more density areas to live from confined aquifers. You can see that as well in the Middle East. Well, there are a lot of confined aquifers in areas that are otherwise very dry. I have some pictures of that later on as well. Absolutely stunning. I thought it would be interesting to talk about stream transport, which is the concept of the rivers, and to explain a bit of how streams are formed, 
how these channels begin, how current flows. I think it's a very interesting topic. Before cars and airplanes existed, people traveled on rivers in 1803. The United States purchased the Louisiana Territory from France. It was a huge tract of over 2 million square kilometers, taking in portions of what today is Texas and Louisiana, and extending up to Montana and North Dakota. In 1804, President Thomas Jefferson asked Meriwether Lewis and well, William Clark to lead an expedition across this new territory and into Western North America. One of their most important goals was to map the Western Rivers, which provided the key, which provided the key to opening up this uncharted frontier. Lewis and Clark decided to follow the Missouri River as that was to the source. They then crossed the Rocky Mountains and followed the Columbia River westward to the Pacific Ocean. The total trip was 6,000 kilometers, with a section along the Missouri River alone extending over 3,200 kilometers and upstream all the way. The writings and maps produced by Lewis and Clark created a body of knowledge that could have been obtained only by following one of the great rivers that drain the interior of North America. Other continents and in other countries, other big rivers evoke a similar, evoke a similar sense of adventure. South America, the Amazon, in Asia, the Yangtze, and the Indus, and Africa, the fabled Nile. Yet streams and rivers are not only the access route for legendary explorations, but also places where people settle and make their home. A body of water flows through almost every town and city in most part of the world. These streams have served as commercial waterways, for barges and streamers, and as a water source for residents, population, and industries. The sediments that they have deposited during floods have built fertile lands for agriculture. Living in a river also entails a risk, however. A river's flood, they destroy lives and property, sometimes on a huge scale. I think how rivers are formed and the ever-evolving nature of it is something very interesting. For example, like a bedrock river right here, which is meandering like this through solid rock over thousands, not millions of years. There's almost no floodplain, as it says in the description. When a river floods, all the suspended sediment, like clay, is flooded and made as overbank deposits, which can be very fertile. This happens a lot in low-lying areas, in hard or bedrock river like this. When the river floods, there's almost no floodplain. Let's read this. Meanders on a great many floodplains, stream channels follow curves and bends called meanders, named for the Mayandros, now Menderes River in Turkey, known in ancient times for its winding, twisting course. Meanders are 
a normal pattern of forward low velocity streams, flowing through gently sloping or nearly flat plains or lowlands, where their channels typically cut through unconsolidated sediments, fine sand, silt, or mud. Or easily erodible bedrock. Meanders are less pronounced but still common in the streams flowing down slightly steeper slopes over harder bedrock. In such terrain, meandering stretches may alternate with long, relatively straight ones. <coughs> A stream that has cut deeply into the curves and bends of its channel may produce incised meanders. And it points us to figure 18.2, which was the one we talked about already. These deep incised meanders like that. Other streams meander on somewhat wider floodplains bounded by steep rocky walls. We are not sure why these two different patterns appear. We do not know that meandering is widespread not only in streams but also in many other kinds of flows. For example, the Gulf Stream, a powerful current in the western North Atlantic Ocean, meanders. Lava flows on Earth meander and planetary geologists have found meanders in former water channels on Mars. It points us to figure 9.20 and 9.21. I think it would be cool to go there. Let's check it out. 9.20 and 9.21. We are now in chapter 16. So we'll have a bit of scrolling speed. the summary. I believe it's 9.20 it said. Oh, I think it went across. There we go. Let's go. 9.20. Channel networks carved into the surface of Mars were revealed by the Viking orbiter. The complexity of these channels suggests that liquid water was probably the main force of the erosion. That's so interesting. You can see it as well. These meanders here, all these little ones, and all these. Like fans out like that. I think that's really cool. It also pointed us to 9.21, which is this one. It reads this image acquired by Mars Global Surveyor shows clear evidence of meandering patterns within sediments deposited inside Eversolde crater. Eversolde, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Liquid water appears to have flowed across the Martian, uh, Mar oh, flowed across the Martian surface and entered the crater, where it deposited sediments in meandering channels similar to seen in the Mississippi River on Earth today. So you can see here where it goes around, like that. Like this would be the main channel, cutting off this bend. And this is an old meander bend, which is very typical for rivers on Earth. And apparently also typical for rivers. Mars. Here we are 
that back again. Let me end this. But I wanted to continue a bit to look at some other things. Here you can see what we just saw on the Martian surface, but then just here on Earth. That's so pretty. You did point out how that works. So you have a relatively straight stream like that, which starts to meander and shift from side to side. They call it a sneaking motion. And you get this snaking motion, which also will create a bit of a current, which erodes to this side, but deposits its sediments on this side, making it go meandering like that. This deposition here is called a point bar, which can also find fossilized and in places from old streams when they're out in the field. Over time, this can take a lot of time. Some rivers can form this within a hundred years. Some rivers have to form this in thousands and thousands of years. But you can see after a long time, you get a very curvy, meandering motion with point parts in the inside vents, but the river will continue to migrate that way, and this will migrate that way. So you get like this one going there, and this one going there. They fall towards each other. And the river will always find its shortest route, so it will break through, depositing the sediments everywhere, and leaving this disconnected. This is known as an oxbow lake. And it's also known as a horseshoe lake because of its very typical shape. You can find this remnants anywhere in a meandering river system. Most of the time when it's not that old and with not that old, I mean, it could be a thousand years. You can find these as a very marshy, swampy area. It is not very nice to tread there. Mosquitoes really inhabit these places a lot. When a river does flood again, and it's not that long ago that a oxbow lake was formed. It can be reactivated. When this goes out of sight, because of a flood, it will always find the oxbow lake first to make use of. Reactivating in general. Those are meandering rivers. Very interesting topic, you see them a lot, but you will only see them in like low-lying areas. But your other form of river that is very common is a braided river, which I have a beautiful picture from here. They say braided streams. They say some streams have many channels instead of a single one. A braided system is a stream whose channel divides into an interlacing network of channels, which then rejoin in a pattern resembling braids of hair. What you see here. So you have a couple of streams. Most of the time these are very shallow streams. There are shallow streams which are found in more sloping areas. Most common form is found 
right in front of a melting glacier. When a glacier melts, it deposits a lot of water from the melting process, which then all flows back into this big, wide plain with a lot of force. Very cold. And it can move quite large sediment grains to even gravel or small pebbles and rocks. You can see here in Iceland, in the colder mountainous places. This is very beautiful. Still streets going right down. Right, let's take a look what else we have here. to rivers, to deserts. I've marked it here. The Jutsu of Wimps and Deserts. It's very interesting as the main process from rivers is such an enormous different process than desert erosion and transportation where the force of water creates different streams forces the river to create different forms the desert is a very relatively calm environment where wind is the driving factor for the formation of what you see on the surface. Deserts are formed mostly in the drier places of Earth, which there are some beautiful pictures of that can illustrate that really nicely. And the process of becoming a desert has a lot to do with where you are on Earth. It also shows very interesting with the global wind patterns with it. Shows right here. You can see that right here. These are the global wind patterns. Let me zoom in a bit for you. You can see the global wind patterns. You can see the rotation of the Earth. The wind patterns are like this. You get a lot of deserts around this area. Let's take a look at some wind blown dust. From the coast of the Nami Desert. But you can just see these streams of dust and sand being blown into the air. I find this very interesting to see. Can get these beautiful dunes like this beautiful dune patterns where the wind comes from this side there are all types of dunes which they all explain here for example 
lower tunes, lower tone tunes, transverse tunes, bulking tunes. These are the coolest thing. They look like a bit of a crescent moon shape. They point towards the downwind. And they are the products of limited sand supply and an unidirectional winds. See it over here. Here you can see the places which I wanted to show you um, of main deserts. Obviously we have the Sahara here. We have the Gobi Desert right there. The Namib Desert which we saw the beautiful picture of. Patagonia, great basin here. These arid and major dune fields are mostly located in the prevailing wind direction, given when it's prevailing westerlies so or prevailing easterlies. It's both a product of the wind. I think I will leave it there for tonight. It's so incredibly beautiful formed landscapes which are possible to explain in these simple processes of wind and water. I think it's so interesting to go into detail on that. I say interesting a lot, but I really do mean it. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you picked up some things that piqued your interest. Sleep well. See you in the next video.